The phone was ringing frantically. I was immediately awakened from sleep. No sooner had I picked it up than I heard a distant rumble. Hurricane gunfire, I thought. The officer on duty reported, An alarm, Mr. Colonel, immediately to the Chief of Staff. It was the beginning of the Soviet counter-offensive. On the calendar sheet, it was November 19, 1942. I put on my tunic, pulled on my boots and hurried to Schmidt's office. Many officers had already arrived there and were awakened, just like me. Chief of Staff Schmidt had already put the entire army on alert. The situation was becoming extremely serious. Gone were those days of tense waiting, when artillery men and tankers did not move away from the guns, always ready to fight back. Infantrymen lay at the machine guns, equipped for continuous fire, and hand grenades they put near themselves. Shortly after, I arrived at Schmidt's place, the army commander. The telephone rang. From Osinovka reported General Strecker, commander of the XI Corps. Here is hell, reported Strecker. Unimaginable hurricane fire fell on our positions. The land is literally ploughed over. We have significant losses, but the main blow, apparently, the Romanians have struck. I got on the phone with my neighbour on the left, IV Romanian Army Corps. His chief of staff is very pessimistic. He fears panic in his troops. Our divisions are holding, but because of the snowstorm, visibility is very poor. We will report to the command about the progress of things. General Paulus explained to Strecker, To ensure your left flank, I intend to put into battle the 14th Panzer Division southwest of Malokletskaya. About further you will know when the direction of the enemy's blow will be specified. Paulus hung up the phone, silently looked at us and again stretched out his hand to the phone. Connect me with Army Group B. The officer of the Operational Department of the Army Group received the first report of the 6th Army on the artillery preparation of the enemy. From that moment the telephone in the office of the Chief of Staff rang almost non-stop. Reports, requests, orders followed one after another prepared to withdraw from the city for a Sondindov tank corps. The general staff was getting information about what was going on from its liaison officer with the 6th Army on its own radio station. This was Major von Zitzewitz of the general staff, who had replaced Major Menzel. But we still knew nothing definite about the enemy's intentions and direction of attack. Finally, about seven o'clock, General Strecker again made himself known. The enemy has struck from his bridgehead. We are still holding our positions. The 3rd Romanian Army has been hit. The 376th Infantry Division reports that the Russians have broken through the positions of the IV Romanian Army Corps and are advancing in a southerly direction. The position of the 1st Romanian Cavalry Division is completely unclear. It no longer has any connection with its left neighbour. I will move the 376th Infantry Division to cover our flank, deploying it with its front to the west. Telephone communication with the 44th Infantry Division is broken. Liaison motorcyclist reported that artillery fire almost completely defeated the front positions of the Romanians, the tanks of the Reds all raised to the ground. Paulus approved the transfer of the 376th Infantry Division to the cut-off positions, demanded to restore communication with the 14th Panzer Division and the 1st Romanian Cavalry Division withdrawn to the east to subordinate to the Exe Army Corps. From the headquarters of Army Group B, we learn it that the Soviet artillery for many hours dropped thousands of tons of steel on the positions of the 3rd Romanian Army. Then, from the bridgehead at Kletskaya and Serafimovich, two strike armies broke through. The Romanians apparently defended courageously, but were crushed and turned to flight. At this time, Soviet armored formations, mechanized infantry units, and cavalry were advancing westward unstoppably. Neither German nor Romanian headquarters could not say where the forward units of the advancing enemy were. One thing was clear the 6th Army was already posing a threat from the rear. My attempts to get an idea of the losses suffered by the XI Army Corps were also unsuccessful. The Corps adjutant informed me that communications had been almost constantly broken since early morning. 
he felt that very heavy losses in the 44th and 376th Infantry Divisions must be reckoned with. November 19th was spent by the officers of the Army Headquarters in languid waiting. Then every hour more and more reports of disaster came in. Although by evening we still had no accurate idea of the extent of Soviet successes, it was clear to everyone that we were in mortal danger. About seven o'clock in the evening I appeared with a report to Paulus. Slouching, he paced back and forth across the room. More often than usual, his face twitched nervously. He stopped in front of me. So, what I had been predicting for weeks had happened. Hitler did not want to recognise what was clear to any ordinary soldier, and Keitel and Jodl backed him up. For weeks we've been treated to empty phrases. Now it's up to us to restore order. In doing so, we still do not know whether we will be able to suspend the counter-offensive of the Red Army. I nodded silently, because I was tormented by the same thoughts. Excitedly, Paulus continued, We are threatened by a colossal danger. I see only one way out of the situation. Withdrawal to the southwest. It is necessary to act quickly. This was also my opinion. So I asked, Is it true that in this case the army command must seek the consent of the general staff? After all, we are talking about 330,000 men. Precisely because it is a question of whether or not to be or not to be the entire 6th Army, I, as you know, proposed to leave Stalingrad. That proposal was rejected. Still in force is the order that no army group commander-in-chief or army commander has the right to leave a settlement or even a trench without Hitler's authorization. Of course, this would paralyse the resolve of any army commander. However, what would it look like if, in a war situation, orders were no longer obeyed? How would that affect the army? The more power a general has, the more he should be an example to his soldiers in obeying orders. This principal position determined Paulus's behaviour in the following days. No matter how urgent circumstances required to act independently, Paulus constantly hesitated but did not make a decision. He remained obedient general. In this he was supported and temperamental, but fanatical chief of staff, Major General Schmidt, and most corps commanders. And I myself, despite the mental clash I was experiencing, could not overcome these, though painful, but hopeless hesitation. On the night of November 19th 20, Army headquarters already had a clear picture of the situation. 14th Armoured Division reported that by the evening of November 19th, tanks and cavalry of the enemy advanced into our rear about 50 kilometres. The artillery regiment of the division had already repulsed vigorous enemy attacks. From new reports, Sikh's Army Corps learned that the Romanians were attacked by strong armoured formations, which, without meeting serious resistance, crushed everything in their path. The survivors fled south and east in fear. Apparently the 3rd Romanian Army no longer existed. But also many of our rear units were panic-stricken in the face of the enemy tearing southward. Naturally, this night in the headquarters no one thought about sleep. All the heads of departments gathered at Schmitz. Without the slightest sign of internal confusion, he explained the new situation west of the Don, ending with the following words, It is necessary to prepare the transfer of the army command post to Nizhne Chirskaya. The command will order the destruction of documents that can be done without, and especially secret files. Optimism and ebullient energy. Schmidt sharply distinguished him from Paulus, exhausted under the weight of the responsibility that fell on him. Chief of Staff was alien to moral problems that tormented the commander of the army. He was in his native element because again had to make decisions, give orders, check their execution. Schmidt was confident that, despite the significant initial successes, the enemy will be able to break after regrouping in open combat and presented Paulus proposals that he developed together with the head of the operational department. The proposals were summarised as follows. Bind your panzer corps in the tank. Regiments of the 16th and 24th Panzer Divisions forced march to the Don, and from the heights west of Golubinsky makes a flank attack on the advancing southward forces of the Red Army and destroys them. 
the headquarters of the 40th Tank Corps moves to the Army Command Post in Golubinskoye. It will be subordinate to the 14th Panzer Division. The actions of assault groups in the city immediately cease. From the site of the Yait and Li Army Corps removed all available units, and from them created a reserve of the 6th Army. The bridgehead on the west bank of the Don, west of Kalach, is occupied under the command of Colonel Mikosh by the Military Engineering School and the Anti-Aircraft Artillery School, reinforced by all the rear service units that can be done without. The officers' school in Suvorovsky is put on alert. Army headquarters from November 21 is transferred to Nizhne Chirskaya, responsible for implementation, Colonel Adam. The wounded and parts of the intendant service, without which it is possible to do without, are withdrawn to the area to the south of the River Chia, as the Russian offensive threatens the railroad and thus the main communications of supply of the army. Paulus approved these proposals. The corresponding orders were sent to the troops. It was already far past midnight. To assume that before dawn there will be new messages, it was impossible. At the command post of the army was nothing to do, and I escorted Paulus to his apartment. On the way, he spoke to me. If the Führer's headquarters approved my proposal to withdraw the 6th Army behind the Don, we would now be spared a severe crisis. Let's hope that at least now Hitler and his entourage will understand the situation and give the order to leave the city. Now it is not so easy, because the entire 3rd Romanian Army is knocked out of the Don front. In fact, there is no one in front of the Russian tank and cavalry formations. Equally little I count on the fact that XXXXASETIKIN Tank Corps Gaim will be able to hold off the Russian onslaught. If you, Mr. General, expect to receive such an order from the Führer's headquarters, would it not be advisable to make the necessary preparations now? While I suggested to the Army Group Command to withdraw all troops from the city, continued Paulus, of course I can not now bring such a decision to the attention of the Army. It could cause panic or at least weaken the resistance. However, the Corps headquarters are already dealing with this issue. However, it should be clear to you that the purpose of the order I signed is to withdraw the army from the threatening encirclement. We approached the shelter of the commander. I said goodbye and returned to my quarters. Oberfeld Feeble Küper was awake. The other clerks were already asleep. Well, Küper, we can get to work. I'm fine, Herr Colonel. You only think you are. Don't be surprised. We must prepare for destruction all unnecessary documents, especially classified command files. Pack up the rest. Headquarters moves to Nizhne Chiskaya tomorrow. That's the way it is. Yesterday I learned a lot of interesting things from motorcyclists, communicators of the Corps. A motorcyclist from the XI Army Corps reported that the Russians had defeated the Romanians and were advancing rapidly southward. I thought it was another fabrication. When about an hour later I learned that you were still in the Nutschstaber, I suspected something wrong. That's why I'm still on my feet. It's not good if we burn documents. Don't panic, Cooper. It's just a precaution. Let's see what today brings. Let the clerk sleep. We'll do it ourselves. The Oberfeld feeble pulled out two steel chests of secret folders from under the bunk and began handing me one document after another. I arranged them into two stacks, documents to be destroyed in case of danger and less secret ones, submissions for awards, vacation orders, etc. After that, each stack of papers was divided into two stacks. Each stack of papers was then tied up and put back into the trunk. By the time we finished the work, it was already dawning. Now get some sleep, Cooper. I'll go to my room, wash and shave. At eight o'clock at the latest, I'll be here again. Half an hour later, while I was still shaving, the telephone rang. The telephonist said, Head of operations, Mr. Colonel. What else could have happened? I thought, putting the receiver to my ear. Immediately report to the Chief of Staff. General Paulus is already here. I heard Elklep's voice on the other end of the wire. After a quick shave, I went to the operations department. Outside, the sharp wind was burning my face, penetrating me through and through. 
Flakes of snow sat on the cloth of my overcoat or melted on my cheeks and chin. In Schmidt's room from a large whitewashed stove, such as are found in peasant huts, there was a pleasant warmth. Army commander, along with the chief of staff, the chiefs of operational and intelligence departments stood in front of the map hanging on the wall. Analyzed the new situation. With intense attention, I watched as the map is put on the latest data. In the area of action of the 4th Tank Army was made a bold red arrow cutting through the center of the front line. The Soviet Army entered the battle and in the southern direction. Paulus summarized. Early this morning, after a strong artillery preparation, the enemy attacked the positions of the 4th Tank Army and the 4th Romanian Army. At the moment, the situation there remains unclear. From the north, the Red Army continued to advance. Its left wing was advancing in a southeastern direction towards Verkhne Businovka. We have to reckon with the fact that in a few hours the XI Army Corps will be cut off the way to the south. The most serious threat is created for the railroad line Morozovskaya, Chia Station. We are in trouble. The Soviet High Command has begun to close its pincers. We tried to prevent this counterattack for the and Exege Zegse Sei Tank Corps. But if this attempt fails, if our tank formations are too weak, what then? Then the enemy will tighten the noose and the Sixth Army will be in the cauldron. I paced restlessly around the room, three steps forward, three steps back. No matter how hard I tried to control myself, my thoughts returned again and again to the operational map. Like menacing ghosts, the red arrows of the advancing enemy rose before my eyes. If I mentally prolong them, they will converge at Kalach. God, what to do? Will our tank regiments succeed? Will they be able to prevent the threat from the rear of the 6th Army? The answer came faster than I would have liked. Paulus summoned me to his office. His room was literally saturated with tobacco smoke. The ashtray on the table was filled to the brim with cigarette butts. Nearby stood an untouched cup of black coffee. The commander was just lighting another cigarette. You know, Adam, that Major General Bessler took over the 14th Armoured Division a few days ago. However, today he filed a sick report saying that his old heart condition has worsened. He requests permission to return to his home country. I have given my consent. A commander who files a report of illness in such a situation is unfit and is a liability to the army. That fat gentleman seemed unsympathetic to me when I first met him, I replied. Nevertheless, I could not suppose that at such a dangerous moment he would abandon his unit to its fate. After all, it is desertion. Let the army group command deal with him. I've informed them of what happened. General Bessler was in a hurry. He'll probably be there soon. Chief of Operations of the 14th Panzer Division reported to Schmidt that Bessler is already in his car on the way to the station cheer. He did not even consider it necessary to wait for the arrival of his successor. What a disgrace that such a lowlife carries the rank of general. Bessler is not just an officer who has forgotten his duty. Already the day before yesterday, at the first contact with the enemy, he was overcome by fear, and he did not give a single order to save his troops from unnecessary losses. A liaison officer of the 14th Armoured Division told me that there was a sharp altercation between Bezler and his chief of operations on this occasion. I do not believe that Bezler is ill. In the language of soldiers, it's called cowardice. He's trembling for his life. We'll see what the investigation reveals. Human resources will look into it. Who do you recommend as Bezler's successor? This matter must be resolved immediately. If Major General Schmidt agrees, I suggest Colonel Lutman, commander of the artillery regiment of the 16th Armoured Division. I consider him one of the most capable officers in our army. He is intelligent, flexible, restrained and energetic. In addition, Lutman has a thorough knowledge of armoured forces. This is especially important in such a difficult situation. After Schmidt approved my proposal, Paulus also gave his consent. By telegraph requested the consent of the personnel department to replace the command of the 14th Panzer Division. 
A few hours later, Colonel Latman appeared at the army headquarters in Golubinsky. Chief of Staff explained to him the situation. It was not necessary to envy the new division commander in connection with the task assigned to him. The 14th Tank Division had already suffered in previous battles heavy losses. Most importantly, the artillery regiment was literally defeated by enemy tanks. We experienced anxious days. There were all sorts of rumours. No one knew where they were coming from. No one knew what was true in them. Was it true that the enemy had cut off the way along the highway on the right bank of the Don to the Shear station? Is it true that he came to the railroad line Morozovskaya, Don, and that the 4th Tank Army was defeated? What measures took the general command of the army to eliminate the threat to the army from the rear? Where is the XXXXXX worst tank corps? Did it go on the offensive? With what results? Our nerves were strained to the limit. Finally, in the evening of November 20th, we learned something about the state of affairs in our left neighbour, the 4th Tank Army. The enemy broke through the German defences from the south and was advancing to the Donator Army Group Command, allocated the 29th Motorised Division to close the gap, but it could not resist the Soviet onslaught. The IV Army Corps and the 20th Romanian Infantry Division retreated and now fought a front to the south. Nothing was known about the other Romanian divisions in the south. According to the latest reports, Soviet tanks had marched right up to the command post of the 4th Tank Army. What turn did the matter take? A gaping hole on our left flank and now also on the right flank. The enemy has broken through our front, broken in several places. The forward units of his advancing troops were rapidly converging, and we had no reserves to prevent a deadly threat. And yet the command of the 6th Army and Army Group B obediently awaited the decision of the Supreme Commander-in-Chief. In the evening finally came the long-awaited telegram. Breakthrough from the encirclement was not authorised. It was necessary to hold Stalingrad. This was the will of Hitler and the General Staff. Paulus, Schmidt, all of us, that is, those who, occupying high command positions, had an idea of the catastrophic situation of the Sixth Army, experienced bitter disappointment but we all obeyed. At night, Major General Schmidt reported to the heads of all departments about the latest developments, received new threatening news, confirmed that the 3rd Romanian Army completely defeated. The gap on our left flank increased. The XI Army Corps and the 14th Panzer Division were bleeding in defensive battles. The 4th Panzer Army was dissected, its headquarters fled to the west, the rear services of all units fled, pursued by Soviet tank wedges. How soon could the enemy be at Golubinsky? Because of such a problem, and thus a real threat to the army command post, there was an urgent need to move it to another location. In Golubinsky, the army command was no longer safe. Therefore, Schmidt, in consultation with Paulus, scheduled the relocation of the command post for November 21st. Before dawn, Stacks of secret files and unnecessary documents were burned on the fires. But even now the Red Army did not leave us alone. Suddenly several headquarters trucks rushed into the villagey. They were supposed to take the road along the right bank of the Don through the Statian Chia to Nizhne Chirskaya. However, after driving a few kilometres away from Golubinsky, they allegedly ran into enemy units. We admitted that the Soviet troops were preparing all sorts of surprises for us but this message we considered pure fantasy. Chief of Operations Colonel Elklep remarked, From fear they dreamed of ghosts, but they were not ghosts. Clarity brought immediately equipped Schmidt motorised reconnaissance under the command of an officer. Several light all-terrain vehicles and motorcycles with lights out and engines shut off were slowly moving southward. Not an hour later they returned, and the patrol commander reported that the red tanks are indeed standing on the right bank of the Don, no more than 20 kilometres south of Golubinsky. Thus, the shortest route to the new command post at Nizhne Chirskaya was cut off. In a vague mood, we reinforced the sentries. Several anti-tank guns took up positions on the road running along the Don. It seemed that nature had turned against us. On the night of November 20th, 21, 
The mercury in the thermometer dropped to minus 20 degrees. The snow shroud that had melted during the day turned into an icy crust. The road connecting Golubinsky with the highway running along the Don became as smooth as a mirror. It was scary to think that our heavy vehicles would have to climb this steep slope. But so far, it did not come to that. Paulus decided to organise between the Don and the Volga advanced command post of the army to ensure reliable and uninterrupted leadership of the troops. There were to be placed the heads of operational and intelligence departments and one quartermaster with the appropriate officers of communication and transportation. It was decided to locate this command post west of Gumrak, in the vicinity of the station. Early in the morning, General Huber, commander of the Fournitiv Tank Corps, arrived in Golubinsky with his staff. He reported that the tank units of the 16th and 24th Panzer Divisions were withdrawn from the front and in the afternoon or evening will go to the Don. This news pleased us all. To Huber in the headquarters treated with great respect, after all it was he once in August broke through the enemy front from the Don to the Volga with his 16th Panzer Division. Of course, I knew that the tanks suffered heavy losses in the battles for the city, but like a drowning man grasping at straws, I pinned my hopes on Huber. Paulus characterised the corps commander the situation on the west bank of the Don. Then he explained his task. Tank regiments of the 14th, 16th and 24th Panzer Division should attack the flank of the enemy advancing south. This was to eliminate the threat to the 6th Army from the rear. The headquarters of the Umtiv Tank Corps occupied our command post in Golubinskoye. The telegraph and telephone network was not interrupted, so the Corps' headquarters maintained communication with all Corps and Division headquarters, as well as with the new Army Command Post. On November 21st, about noon, I accompanied Paulus and Schmidt to the airfield at Golubinsky. There were only two storms standing there, which were to take the generals and their personal adjutants to the new command post. All other aircraft from the communications squadron of the army headquarters were relocated to Nizhny Chirskaya. Shaking my hand in farewell, Paulus added, On November 21st, about noon, I accompanied Paulus and Schmidt to the airfield at Golubinsky. There were only two storms standing there, which were to take the generals and their personal adjutants to the new command post. All other aircraft from the communications squadron of the army headquarters were relocated to Nizhny Chirskaya. Shaking my hand in farewell, Paulus added, Get on the road immediately. You must cross the Don at Peripolny and move along the eastern bank to the south. At the latest tomorrow morning we will see each other in Nizhny Chirskaya. Barely had the airplanes left the ground as a barrage of fire was opened from the Pridonsky Heights. Let's hope that everything will turn out safely, I thought. After all, storms can fly only at low altitude. But we had to hurry. A passenger car brought me back to the village. All headquarters equipment was already loaded on several dozen cars. Taking into account the proximity of the enemy, I found it expedient to form five columns. Each of them was under the command of the head of the department, including the head of the Army Engineering Service, Colonel Zell and the Head of Communications, Colonel Arnold. I led the fifth column. We expected, after crossing the Don, to gather in Peskovatka at the headquarters of the Beatty Army Corps and from there together to move on. With difficulty we climbed up the icy road on the steep bank. Sometimes drivers and teams had to help each other. Eventually all the cars made it up the climb. At first the highway on the high bank of the Don was almost empty. We were moving forward quickly, but as we approached the bridge in Perepolnoye, we moved slower and slower. More and more often the way was blocked by overturned cars and wagons. Boxes of all kinds and sizes were lying in the middle of the road and we were forced to go around them. Rifles, steel helmets, as well as a few broken guns and even two or three tanks with Wehrmacht insignia marked the path of retreat of the Romanian and German formations. Everything here spoke of flight. Cars from the west were entering the highway. They were trying to drive onto it wherever there was even the slightest gap between the cars on the highway, 
so that it was almost impossible to maintain the formation of one's own column. Closer to the bridge, the disorder threatened to turn into chaos. Night had fallen. With extinguished headlights, our cars slowly moved at second speed. Suddenly there was shouting and swearing on the road. Then everything came to a halt. Getting out of the car to find out the cause of the jam, I met Colonel Zell. He had set out with his convoy half an hour ahead of me. I assumed he was already on the east bank. Zell, with his companion Captain Gotsman, was trying to clear the jam. It wasn't easy because the 16th Panzer Division was moving toward us. Its steel giants were crossing the Don from east to west to occupy the initial area specified by the Army Command. The immediate cause of the traffic jam was a tank that stalled on a completely icy road and got in the way. Zell was only a short distance from this point. Captain Gotsman was just getting out of his car when the next tank came up, which also stalled. The captain's foot was caught under the track, and he was wounded so badly that he died shortly afterward. After this incident, we moved slowly onward across the ice. It was not until many hours later that we got all the vehicles across the bridge. After a short rest at the headquarters of the Veiti Army Corps, after waiting for all the columns to assemble, we moved south along the eastern bank of the Don. The steppe was covered with freshly fallen snow. It also covered the roads so that the columns had to move forward by compass. About five o'clock in the morning of November 22nd, we passed through Kalach. With the exception of a few guard posts, everything was plunged into a deep sleep, as if the enemy were very far away. In a village a little farther to the southeast, where the army supply office was located, there was still a profound silence. Utterly frozen, we rested there for an hour, enjoying the warmth of the room, hot coffee and, as a special treat, freshly baked bread. I ordered the Oberquartermeister to be awakened. It turned out that he was completely unaware of what a dangerous situation had developed. Now he had sounded the alarm and was preparing to redeploy, but that was easier said than done. Thousands of tons of transports were needed to carry food supplies, uniforms and field mail. Two days later I learned that much had to be destroyed, from the army supply department to the bridge over the Don at Nizhne Shirskaya was no longer a short distance. But what we experienced now surpassed everything that had gone before. A terrible picture. Driven by fear of the Soviet tanks, trucks, cars, staff cars, motorcycles, horsemen and goose-stepping vehicles were rushing westward. They ran over each other, got stuck, overturned, clogged the road. Pedestrians scrambled, trampled, squeezed, scrambled between them. Those who stumbled and fell to the ground could not get up on their feet. They were trampled, run over, crushed. In a feverish effort to save their own lives, people threw everything that prevented a hasty escape, threw weapons and equipment, cars fully loaded with ammunition, field kitchens and supply wagons, stood motionless on the road. After all, it was possible to move forward faster on harnessed horses. Wild chaos reigned in Verknicherskaya. The fugitives from the 4th Tank Army were joined by soldiers and officers of the 3rd Romanian Army and the rear services of the XI Army Corps moving from the north. All of them, gripped by panic and stupor, were similar to each other. All fled to Nizhnechirskaya. On November 22nd, about nine o'clock, I arrived with the last columns in Nizhnechirskaya and reported to Paulus that the order to move the command post was carried out. He was just sitting with Colonel General Goth, commander of the 4th Tank Army. Both commanders and several officers from their headquarters were discussing the situation. Soon I was to reappear in the room where the meeting was held. A radiogram had been received from Hitler, which I passed on to Paulus. He read aloud a brief text. Goth with his staff was withdrawn for other assignments. Paulus and Schmidt was ordered to fly immediately to the limits of the forming cauldron and place the command post of the army near the station Gumrak. On all faces reflected amazement. If Goth, apparently, was pleased that he was spared from solving complex issues, Paulus and Schmidt deeply thought, This is not surprising. 
After all, the high command in the created catastrophic situation entrusted to them a huge responsibility. Again received new alarming news. Fortiul Panzer Corps under the command of General Huber, which was to suspend the enemy's advance attacking his flank, was almost completely without fuel. There was no time to think about the offensive. The corps could not hold its positions, and the enemy pressed it to the east of the Don, as well as the Exai Army Corps. The strategically important bridge across the Don at Kalach was surrendered without a fight. The road to the south, the intended route of retreat of the Sixth Army, was mostly in the hands of the enemy. Only a few kilometres separated his advanced detachments from Kalach. There were no forces capable of stopping him. We had to reckon with the fact that the cauldron would close during this day. Good luck in battle. Colonel General Goth wished General Paulus goodbye. This was a more than dubious wish in this cursed situation. Fiesler Storch was already waiting for Paulus and Schmidt. Just before leaving, the commander called me to him. We must part, Adam. I don't know when we'll see each other again. As senior officer, you'll be in charge of headquarters. As soon as the Red Army reaches the lower reaches of the Chia River, move the headquarters through Tormasin to Morozovskaya and combine it with the rear office of the army, which has already left there. I escorted Paulus and Schmidt to the airfield, which was on the outskirts of the city. We silently said goodbye, and they boarded the plane. The propellers shrieked, full gear was engaged. The airplanes rolled, got off the ground, flew east, crossed the Don, and quickly disappeared behind the opposite wooded bank. It took more than an hour to drive five or six kilometres to my headquarters. The car was barely moving, making its way through streets clogged with people and all sorts of vehicles. Nizhnechirskaya had turned it into an army camp. With lightning speed the news spread that the army headquarters was located here. Where the headquarters is, there is security. That's what thousands of soldiers thought and stayed in the small Cossack town on the Chia River. In the evening, I contacted the commandant of the Chia station by phone. What do you know about the enemy? Where are his advanced units? Unfortunately, I can't tell you that, Mr. Colonel. There are only a few men left with me. The rest have retreated with loaded vehicles. There are still several hundred tons of food, equipment and fuel stored here. I don't know how I can get them out of here. I don't have enough vehicles. There are hundreds of trucks stuck here. I'll try to get some of it to you. Keep in touch with me under any circumstances. If anything new happens, let me know immediately. Colonel Mikoshi's battle group is stationed in Verkhnechirskaya. Join it if the enemy forces you to leave the station. But be sure to take with you all your weapons, all your machine guns. Hardly had I hung up the receiver when the telephone rang again. I was glad to hear Paulus's voice. We've landed safely. How are you doing? The cheer station is still in our hands. In lower cheer, thousands of cars are clogging the streets. But I'm surprised, Mr. General, that you and I can talk on the telephone. After all, the wire runs through an area that the Russians have already captured in many places. Maybe they haven't discovered it yet, or maybe they want to intercept conversations. Keep in touch with us by radio. Have a good day. The End Colonel Abraham and Captain Goebel came to see me. They reported the arrival of the officer's school, which I had called to Nizhnechirskaya. The telephone rang again. Colonel Winter, Chief of Operations of the Headquarters of Army Group B, was interested in the situation on the lower reaches of the Chia River. From him I also learned that in the area of Verkhnechirskaya, east of Morozovsk, no more German soldiers. This was extremely unpleasant. Something had to be done urgently. I proposed to form from the soldiers accumulated here a combat group to protect Nizhnechirskaya and the bridgehead east of the Don at Verkhnechirskaya. The core of the group was to be the officers' school. Winter fully agreed. However, at night I could not do much. Therefore, I instructed Captain Goebel to send reinforced reconnaissance detachments in a northerly direction to the station Cheer and northwest, 
to the confluence of the Liski River into the Chia River, to establish communication with Colonel Mikosh and to organize the security of Nizhnechirskaya. The commandant of the city was ordered to assemble a convoy of trucks and send it to the Chia station. About 23 hours army group again called me on the phone and transmitted the following order, prepare by the forces of combat defence groups, bridgehead east of the Don and the railway line to ensure the 6th Army after the abandonment of Stalingrad withdrawal in the southern direction. I breathed a sigh of relief. So, the army group command still expected to receive an order from the general command of ground forces to withdraw from the encirclement. Immediately, I called to my staff officers to discuss the measures for November 23rd. First of all, it was necessary to eliminate the traffic jam created by transportation on the streets of Nizhnechirskaya. All the officers of the headquarters and the commandant's office of the city were sent to fulfil this task. At the same time, it was ordered to supply all the rear guard, soldiers and officers, except for drivers, with weapons and ammunition and send them to the assembly point near the school. There they would be divided into squads. At last there was silence. Deadly tired, I lay down on the mattress, but I could not sleep. The events of the last three days came back to life in my memory. In my heart I cursed Hitler and the general staff. It was they who brought us to such a desperate situation because they brushed aside all the suggestions and warnings of the army command, the main condition for successful leadership of troops, the correct assessment of the enemy. The high command violated this principle in the most irresponsible and thoughtless way, what in fact could be done now when the army is actually already surrounded. Only one thing, to break through to the southwest. In the meantime, it is necessary to hold the bridgehead across the Don east of Nizhnechirskaya. I firmly decided to use all forces to achieve this goal. The phone rang again. The head of the operational department of the army group demanded data on the situation on the lower shear. No changes so far, I replied. And how are things in other parts of our army? Ixai army and X85 tank corps are fighting, having in the rear of the Don Ivy Army Corps, relying on Stalingrad, repulses fierce attacks from the south. Arriving at the command post in Gumrak, Paulus consulted with all corps commanders with whom he was able to establish contact. They unanimously proposed to raise again the question of the withdrawal of the 6th Army for the Don Army Group immediately supported this proposal. But we've just received a reply from Hitler's headquarters. Listen carefully. According to the Führer's order, the 6th Army must under all circumstances hold Stalingrad and the front on the Volga. If because of a breakthrough on the flanks will become necessary to organise a circular defence, then continuing to hold Stalingrad to organise a circular defence, move the Army Command Post to the area northeast of Kalak, the Army Corps, 297th Infantry Division, 371st Infantry Division, 29th Motorised Division of the 4th Panzer Army are transferred to the 6th Army. Colonel Winter on the other end of the wire made a short pause, as if he wanted to give me time to get used to Hitler's order. Then he continued, Army Command immediately opposed this order, because there is no possibility to carry out the transfer of troops needed to form a circular defence. There are no available units needed to fill the gaps on the flanks of the army. It is unclear whether it is possible to withdraw units from the city, and on the newly formed defence line there are no fortified positions, no forest for the construction of positions and shelters. This order to take a circular defence of the entire army. Madness, I muttered. And what will happen to our divisions fighting west of the Don? They must, by order of Hitler, be withdrawn eastward beyond the Don, answered Winter. But, regardless of the general staff's point of view, do, Adam, do everything possible to hold the bridgehead and the defence along the river cheer. That was the end of the conversation. It is clear that I will spare no effort to hold the area entrusted to me. But what awaits actually surrounded 20 German and two Romanian divisions? 
What is this meanness on the part of the main command of land forces? And should Paulus fulfil the order given by Hitler? Shouldn't he, relying on his immeasurably greater awareness, act on his own, break through to the southeast before it's too late? No matter how much I pondered the situation, in one thing I was sure. Paulus, to the depths of his soul disciplined and obedient soldier. He would rather die with his army than rebel. General Paulus was to me internally very close, and as a chief, and as a man. I sympathised with him, understanding what mental conflict he is experiencing. I regretted that in these difficult hours I could not be together with him at the forward command post near Gumrak. At that midnight hour the telephone rang again. Paulus, on the still unbroken line of communication, was interested in how we are doing and when the army headquarters will move to Tormosin. He sadly replied to my report, The cauldron has already closed, Adam. But, Mr General, retired soldiers from areas east of the Don are constantly arriving here, so the ring of encirclement is not very tight. What good is it if we're chained to the city? came the bitter reply. From some of his words, I caught that the command of Army Group B, who shared Paulus's view of the need to break out of the encirclement, was not inclined to act on their own responsibility. Moreover, it pointed out to him that he should until receiving new directives to follow the orders of the general command of the land forces. Fatigue eventually overcame me, but the sleep that brought oblivion did not last long. About two o'clock in the morning, I was unceremoniously awakened. Standing before me was Colonel Arnold, the Army's Chief of Communications. The Commandant of Cheer Station no longer answers. My line patrols report heavy rifle and machine gun fire in the direction of the railroad. I don't know the details yet. Mikosh's task force has sent a reconnaissance to Cheer Station. I jumped up from the mattress. Immediately summoned to me, the Commandant of Nizhne Chirskaya and Captain Gobel. I felt the weight of responsibility for the exhausted soldiers who took refuge in the city, for weapons and equipment. Responsibility for the Sixth Army, over which a mortal danger loomed. The officers summoned to me immediately appeared. I informed them of the latest developments. Captain Gobel, I said, immediately send a new reconnaissance. I must urgently find out what is the situation at the station cheer, where the advanced detachments of the enemy inform our scouts that Task Force Mikosha is also scouting in the direction of the station cheer. I ordered the commandant of the city to strengthen security at the exits from the village and scout the area between the city and the station. From telephone conversations with Mikosha's group, it became clear that the reconnaissance data had not yet been received. The colonel feared not to be surrounded because of the enemy's advance to the south. I informed him that with the onset of the day west of Verkhnechirskaya on the plain, about two kilometres south of the railroad, we will put into battle a reinforced combat group. I further suggested that he establish close cooperation with the task force of Colonel Chekhol on the Pridonsky bridgehead. The flanks of both groups converged at the destroyed railroad bridge across the Don to raise the Alarm Army headquarters, to report the situation to the command of Army Group B, to organise reconnaissance and map out the way to Tormasin. These were my further actions. In the meantime, intelligence reported that the enemy with his advanced units saddled the railroad bed at the station cheer, and his patrols leaked to the south, although retreated when our side was fired upon. Dawn was breaking in the east, and a new day, November 23rd, was dawning. Headquarters officers continued to clear the traffic jam at the southern exit from the city. Grimly and reluctantly, the drivers carried out the orders given to them. The mood changed instantly when one of the cadets at the officer's school casually remarked that the Russians had already passed the railroad. Dull indifference was replaced by feverish activity. Stronger than the order was fear. It urged to act with lightning speed. Captain Gobel organised in Nizhne Chirskaya school assembly point for soldiers who broke away from their units. Detachments under the command of cadets from the officers' school arrived there from all sides. They were armed and supplied with ammunition to immediately form companies and battalions. The teachers of the officers' school were appointed as battalion commanders, 
the cadets as company and platoon commanders. The newly formed units immediately took their designated positions. By midday, the 1st Battalions were already standing, ready for defence, west of Verkhnechirskaya. I entrusted Captain Goebel to command them. It probably did not occur to him that he would have to command such a motley, hastily assembled detachment. They were mostly soldiers from the rear service, field post, TOTS construction organisation. They were joined by a small number of retired soldiers from those divisions that had fallen to the Soviets and furloughed. They were armed with rifles, pistols and three-hand machine guns. This did not inspire much enthusiasm, but they were all eager to help their comrades who were surrounded in the area between the Volga and the Don. The news that the cauldron is closed confirmed to me the quartermaster of the 6th Army, captain of the General Staff Tjumpling. He participated in the defensive battles near Kalach and, having fled to the Don, watched as the Soviet pincers closed to the east of Stalingrad. In a few hours, Nizhnechirskaya became empty. The passable roads had been cleared. I turned command of the headquarters over to Colonel Zell and instructed him to transfer the headquarters to Tormasin, while I myself remained in Nizhnechirskaya. Now my main task was to obtain anti-tank guns, artillery, mortars and tanks for the battle groups. Without these weapons, they could not offer serious resistance to the enemy. Already early in the morning, by telephone, I ordered our workshops in Tormasin all the repaired guns, tanks and machine guns to be delivered to Nizhnechirskaya as soon as possible, not later than in the evening. Indeed, already in the afternoon, the first guns began to arrive. Colonel Zelle, having arrived at Tormosin, energetically supported this endeavour. He literally cleaned everything out of the workshops, forced the repair squads to work day and night, delivered guns and ammunition almost daily, spurred on by fear. I tried to visit all the battle groups. On a light all-terrain vehicle I made the way back, on which I arrived not more than a day ago. Already the day before it was impossible to say that the road was in order but now I could find no words, amazed at the chaos created by the panic flight. A continuous stream of soldiers were coming, spurred on by fear. A detachment of about 20 Germans and Romanians approached my car. They were all unarmed, unshaven, in rags. Where are you from? What unit do you belong to? I asked a German non-commissioned officer. We are from the 4th Panzer Army. We are lagging behind our units. The Russians are right behind us, Herr Colonel. That's nonsense. You see, I'm going where you came from. There's already a new front there. Why aren't you fighting? Have you decided to abandon your comrades to their fate? Where are your weapons? We are drivers, Mr. Colonel. Our weapons are in the cars. Where are the cars? We had to leave them in one village, otherwise we wouldn't have gotten out. There are Russians everywhere. We've been starving for two days. Go to the Commandant of Nizhnechirskaya. It's a village behind the forest. They'll feed you there. And first of all, get a good sleep, then everything will be different. They saw me off with surprised looks as my car started off again towards Verkhnechirskaya. Apparently they could not understand how one could drive towards a terrible danger. And I did not understand how the German troops could so quickly fall in spirit how it happened that the very soldiers who, a few months ago, confident of victory, were marching across the Don Steppes, retreated so unwillingly. Was it fear for their own lives, or fear of capture? Did they finally doubt the very meaning of the war? In Verkhnechirskaya, I met Colonel Mikosh. His battle group was deployed only one and a half kilometres from the enemy, but his dugouts and trenches were well equipped. The soldiers could take turns sleeping in the houses located behind the front line, which, however, were now and then shelled from Katyusha. And Mikosh did not have a single gun or mortar to answer the enemy. Even more difficult was the situation of Colonel Chekhov's battle group on the Pridonsky bridgehead, which I visited later. It had entrenched itself on the edge of the forest, and it was attacked time and again by small Soviet units that gave the soldiers no rest. The lack of heavy weapons was even more dangerous for them than it was for Mikosh. Without artillery support, said Colonel Chekel, we won't last long here. We need at least a few tanks, 
Workshops in Tormosin will send to Nizhna Chirskaya all serviceable heavy guns, bring ammunition. I hope to help you with something tomorrow. I consoled him, adding a few more words about the defensive measures taken in the morning. Then I moved on to the newly created combat group Goebel. In accordance with the order, it is entrenched west of Verkhna Chirskaya, two kilometres south of the railroad. Detachment of Captain Goebel numbering about 150 people had only one field kitchen. This, of course, was far from enough. But on the road on which the troops were retreating, there were many field kitchens. I allowed Goebel to take from there everything he could use. Vehicles, equipment, ammunition and weapons. On his left flank something suspicious was happening. Wherever his reconnaissance went, it could not find even one German soldier anywhere. The enemy is enough to advance at night on this road along the River Cheer, and we will be trapped, Mr. Colonel. I'll request reinforcements from Army Group as soon as I return. You'll get an answer from me immediately. Do you have contact with Lower Cheer? Yes, Mr. Colonel, I just talked to the duty officer. It was with some relief that I headed back. Of course, without heavy weapons, our situation is dire. But if the enemy leaves us alone for a few days, we can strengthen our defences. I thought it wise to have all three battle groups under a single command. This would increase their combat effectiveness in the event of a Russian offensive. That same day, I decided to talk about this with the command of the army group. During my absence, our officer, a teacher at the Suvorovsky Military School, had formed six more companies from retired soldiers. I immediately sent them under his command to the front line. In cooperation with Captain Goebel's battle group, they secured the roads along the river on both sides of the cheer. Thus was strengthened another dangerous area of defence. Little by little, the burden of worries became lighter. The front received other welcome help. The commandant of the town reported that on November 22nd, a fully manned company of a bakery and a platoon of a field slaughterhouse arrived in Nizhne Chirskaya. They hid from enemy tanks, which in the current situation it was difficult to blame them for. Both of these units I immediately included in the combat groups. I had another conversation with Army Group B. The connection was established within a few minutes. Colonel Winter came to the machine. I reported to him that put into battle 18 companies west of Verkhna Chirskaya, as well as other measures I took. So far, the enemy has not yet saddled the railroad going south. Today I went around all the combat groups. Our main problem is that we have almost no heavy weapons at all. It's also fraught with complications that the three battle groups are not under unified command. I suggest we merge them into a divisional battle group. Agreed. Who will take command of the battle group? I have here Colonel Abraham of the 76th Infantry Division. We recalled him from the front a month ago due to illness. He's quite well now. I think he's a perfect fit. I agree. You know Abraham better than I do. But without a capable staff, he'll be helpless. This is the headquarters of the Army Artillery Commander. The General is not here, so the entire staff can go to Abraham. May I give the appropriate orders? Of course, Adam. Do you have any other questions? Uh, sure. What's the status of the area to our left? Intelligence reports that there are no German soldiers there. Unfortunately, that's true. The front has been breached for several hundred kilometres. We don't yet know how to close this gigantic gap. If I have a division free somewhere, I'll deploy it to your left. Until then we'll have to operate in battle groups formed from the remnants of retreating units. That's not a very good prospect. If we had at least anti-tank vehicles with enough ammunition and a few dozen infantry officers. Most companies are commanded by non-commissioned officers. I've taken your wishes into consideration. We'll help in any way we can. But you know it's hard to plug all the holes. By the way, where are you going to set up your command centre? It's dangerous to stay in Nizhne Chirskaya. Today I moved our headquarters to Tormasin. Personally, I'm staying here until the situation at Chira and the Pridonsky bridgehead is stabilised. After this conversation, I called Colonel Abraham to me, informed him of the proposal to take command of the newly created divisional group 
and informed him that the Army Group headquarters approved this step. To my great amazement, he declined, citing illness. Rarely have I been so disappointed in my comrades as I was in Abraham. We demanded of the common soldiers that they give their last effort, but what was a career officer and regimental commander to do? He cited illness, although there were no signs of ill health during the last weeks of his stay at Suvorovsky. The behaviour of my old colleague I assessed as a fraud, and it made no difference that Abragum presented a doctor's certificate, nevertheless I had to reckon with him according to the rules. Without hesitation I decided that I myself will take command of the battle group. General Paulus, with whom I, strangely enough, still maintained wire communication, approved of my decision. Provide me with a way to retreat, Adam, said Paulus. The general command of the land forces must authorise a breakthrough from the encirclement, if it has not finally gone mad. The command of Army Group B also gave its consent. Its operations department informed me that by order of General von Zodenstern, Chief of Staff of the Army Group, I report directly to the Army Group until new orders. I assembled the staff of the Commander of the Artillery of the Army, distributed duties, gave a number of orders, ensuring a clear organisation of combat groups. Left alone again, for a few minutes I gave free rein to my thoughts. It was already dark. The electric lamp on the table was casting a light circle, touching with its outer edge the windows to the street, which were covered with a thick layer of ice. It was bitterly cold. Already in the afternoon the thermometer showed 15 degrees below zero. At night the frost could reach 25 degrees, and the troops were at the positions without winter uniforms, in the steppe under the penetrating icy wind. Was there any sense at all with such a hastily assembled detachment, without anti-tank means, without artillery, without mortars, without tanks, without even a sufficient number of machine guns to try to create a defensive line, which in its current state would be broken through by any strong enemy attack? Didn't that mean the senseless sacrifice of soldiers? But I remembered my last telephone conversation with Paulus. Provide me with a path of retreat, Adam. Yes, I must do everything in my power to preserve this opportunity for the 22 divisions caught in the cauldron. It is now my highest duty. It is an urgent task. It is a matter of life and death for nearly a quarter of a million men trapped in the cauldron. I am responsible for them. Therefore, putting aside all doubts, we must concentrate all forces to ensure the defence of the battle groups. Strengthened after an agonising internal struggle in my decision, it was as if I gave a boost to the forces outside. The staff officer reported to me the arrival of heavy weapons from Tormasin, two 88mm anti-aircraft guns, four 105mm howitzers and four 55mm anti-tank guns. The next day the tanks were to arrive. My mood rose. If we are supported and the army group, we will stop the enemy. On the night of November 24th, Captain Goebel reported on the lively activity of Soviet intelligence. In the following days the enemy attacked us several times with small forces. Undoubtedly he probed the strength of our defences. Gradually the Soviet attacks became more and more sensitive, the fighting more and more persistent, and our losses more and more serious. Soon after the beginning of the Red Army counter-offensive, the General Command of Land Forces carried out a number of organisational measures in relation to the troops fighting on the Don and in Stalingrad. The 6th Army, the battle groups on the Chir and the remnants of the 3rd Romanian Army formed a new army group, Don, which was to operate between Army Groups A and B. The commander of Army Group Don on November 28th was appointed Field Marshal General von Manstein. My battle group was subordinated to XXXivit Tank Corps, the headquarters of which was transferred to Tormazin. This corps, under the command of Lieutenant General Heim, to the beginning of the offensive, was in the rear of the 3rd Romanian Army and had to stop the enemy offensive. General Paulus has repeatedly told me that he considers this one of the most dangerous illusions of the general command of the land forces. And indeed, disaster broke out. Both significantly weakened divisions of Heim were surrounded. 
With the small remnants of his troops, he managed to make his way west. Hitler made him a scapegoat and removed him from his post. Despite the fact that his divisions clearly lacked combat experience, equipment and numbers, von Heim was blamed for the Soviet breakthrough. The general was expelled from the Wehrmacht, but later rehabilitated. He was succeeded by General von Knobelsdorf of the Panzer Forces, who arrived at Tormosin on December 1st. These organisational changes and rearrangements of commanders alone, of course, could not improve the situation in dangerous areas. On the entire Chira front, from the mouth of the river to its headwaters, the situation was gradually becoming catastrophic. It would be enough for the enemy to attack with larger forces, and our battle groups would not be able to resist the onslaught. The Soviet troops were getting deeper and deeper into various sections of our defences. We needed immediate reinforcements. In early December, the 336th Infantry Division took up a position to the left of my battle group. In addition, several companies of the Air Field Division were subordinated to me. They were splendidly armed and equipped, and most importantly, they had what our soldiers dreamed of most of all, winter uniforms. It is understandable that the mood of my infantrymen could not improve when they saw all these piles of fur coats, fur vests, fur hats, felt boots, winter warm mittens, cotton camouflage suits, which were supplied to the soldiers of the Air Force, which was under the patronage of Goering. To top it all off, they were also scandalised in combat. Most of the officers were arrogant, although they did not have the slightest idea about combat infantry. During these days, General von Knobelsdorf visited me in Lower Cherskoy. He confirmed what I already knew from rumours. In the area of Kotelniki, east of the Don, was preparing to strike a new 4th Panzer Army, under the command of Colonel General Gotha. In the coming days, it was to break through the encirclement ring and deploy an offensive on a broad front. At the same time, the army group under the command of General Infantry Hollett had to, from the area west of the headwaters of the Cheer, to attack the flank of the enemy advancing to the south. XXXXFDs, Panzer Corps, under the command of General von Knobelsdorf together with the newly arrived 11th Panzer Division, and still expected compounds were to advance from the bridgehead east of Nizhnyczeskaya. The Corps commander received from us detailed information about the situation on the Pridonsky bridgehead and the location of enemy troops. The appearance of German tanks in close proximity to us caused a huge upsurge among soldiers and officers. For many days they fought bloody battles, suffering heavy losses, holding in the most difficult conditions defensive line against a strong, stubborn and courageously fighting enemy. Many of my soldiers and officers had friends and relatives in the cauldron. They considered it a duty of honour to contribute to their liberation. Nevertheless, the troops were extremely exhausted, surrendering physically and morally. It was inevitable. No less influential was the leak of information about the persistence with which Hitler and the general command of the army rejected all reasonable proposals to break through the cauldron from within. Why are we here on the banks of the Volga, Mr. Colonel? Every day I was on the front line. Often I was asked, why should we take these positions at all if the army is to remain in the cauldron? More and more often I talked to an elderly soldier, a participant in the battles of the last year of the First World War. One day he said to me, Mr. Colonel, I do not understand why. In fact, we are here on the Don and on the Volga. I think that if I am killed today or tomorrow, my wife and children will not even know why I fought here. To tell the truth, I don't know it myself. It was immediately clear to me that this is a serious matter. If this kind of sentiment spreads, we will disarm. That is something I must resist. I have tried to do so in the following words. Think only of our compatriots who are surrounded. If we do not hold this bridgehead, if we surrender the defensive line along the Cheer, our main front will have to be pulled back many kilometres. Then we will not have to think about restoring communication with our units in the cauldron. Now we are fighting to save the lives of 330,000 of our comrades. My interlocutor was silent. After a short pause, I said, 
I do not know the intentions of the High Command. But in any case, one thing is clear. We cannot sit idly by. This is war. As soldiers, we must do our duty. Deep down, I felt awkward giving that answer. It evaded the essence of the question the soldier asked. Why did we even end up here, on the banks of the Don and Chia? Why did we strive to take Stalingrad? For the sake of what and here, and in this cauldron everyday Kiled or Kripled, starving and freezing hundreds, thousands of people. From this main problem I tried to distract my interlocutor with my speeches, but it was not an answer. These questions tormented me too, no matter how hard I tried to dismiss them. However, they did not overpower me completely, did not push me to any conclusions. Tradition, sense of duty, sympathy for my comrades in the boiler, all this overrode the voice of reason. In addition, in our immediate vicinity, intensive preparations for a de-blocking strike had begun. This gave us hope, caused an elevated mood. Maybe within a fortnight we would get through the trouble. After December always comes May, 51. These were the words of a soldier's song, which, however, we have no one sings, but which is almost daily broadcast on the radio. All feverishly awaited the day when the D-blocking army will strike. In the meantime, may still loom it in the Undria Chabli distance. We had only the beginning of December in the truest sense of the word, and things were proceeding accordingly. After the 336th Infantry Division took up positions on our left, strong Soviet units struck at its section. The division was pushed back. This posed a threat to our left flank. True, the 11th Panzer Division restored the position. But in the meantime, flames broke out elsewhere, and it too had to be extinguished by the 11th Armoured Division. It really turned into a frontline fire department, which rushed to where the thin thread of our defence was threatening to break under the enemy's onslaught. However, in these day and night manoeuvre battles, she also suffered greatly. In our area we no longer saw it, although we were in dire need of tank support in view of the ever-increasing attacks of the enemy. Things were bad at the Pridonsky bridgehead. It was getting narrower and narrower. It was felt that soon it would have to be cleared. All this once again significantly worsened the mood. If a few days ago the arrival of our tanks contributed to the uplift of spirits, now the mood fell faster than ever. It had become commonplace for soldiers to leave their positions without authorization. Refusal to obey was reported to us. The fear of being taken prisoner gripped everyone. The officers, too, were anxious to get out of the trap as soon as possible. In the meantime, wire communication with the cauldron had been cut off. But radio messages were coming in continuously. Major General Schmidt called from headquarters officers and clerks. They flew from Morozovsk to the boiler on the airplanes that provided it with supplies. One of the Nakshtab's radiograms read, The commander of the communications regiment of the 6th Army, Colonel Schrader, immediately fly to the boiler. He must replace the sick chief of communications of the army. Since our headquarters had in the meantime moved from Tormusin to Morozovsk, I passed the radiogram there, to the chief quartermaster of the army. Not an hour later it was reported from there that Colonel Schrader was ill. This was the third time in two weeks that a senior officer of the 6th Army had essentially deserted. Major General Schmidt, the chief of staff, demanded that Colonel Schrader be court-martialed. How that ended, I never learned.